Welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal, season three. This season, we'll be featuring 12 episodes with 12 guest speakers from Barbados, Delaware, Grenada, Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Washington, and Virginia. Now here's our host, Dr. Desmond Hartwell Murray, and today's co-host, Ms. Padmini Ramitar, and today's special guest, Professor Douglas Talamy. All right, so welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season three. Um, you can find more information about uh, Environmental Fridays at our website, www.theenvironmentalfridays.com. So today is a very special presentation that we have. Um, yeah, I was going to head on my self here. So it's noted by the um, United Nations Environmental Program that there are three major global environmental issues. One is pollution, the other climate change, and the other biodiversity. And that's basically what we will be delving into today with the help of Professor Talami. So you'll hear more about that um, coming up pretty soon. Uh, coming up next week, see that looks like fish and crab or something with some drinks by the sea. Next week, we will deal with uh, sustainable food, beverage, and hospitality industries. They also, those industries also have an impact on the environment. And Jordan Norbert from St. Lucia, the island of St. Lucia, will talk to us and discuss um, how this could be done in a sustainable, uh, sustainable way. Today, my co-host, my friend, <laughs> um, a very strong supporter of uh, Environmental Fridays is Padmani Ramatar. She teaches at Bishop Anstey and Trinity College East, sixth form in Trinidad. And she teaches all levels of uh, biology and environmental science um, and has been doing this for the last uh, six or seven years. She had uh, pursued and completed a double major in chemistry and biology at the undergraduate level at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine in Trinidad. And she's currently pursuing her master's in chemistry at the same university. She's very passionate about educating and developing minds. She implements um, a unique and resourceful environment that fosters learning and success within a classroom and uh, um, tries to get her students also involved and passionate about uh, environmental conservation. So she is my speaker for today, my host for today, sorry. And she will now go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Good morning, everyone. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Douglas Talamy. So Professor Douglas Talamy is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 106 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books include Bringing Nature Home, The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, and The Nature of Oaks, winner of the American Horticultural Society's 2022 Book Awards. 
Yes, let's welcome Professor Douglas Talamy. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Padmani. So, so Doug, yes. could you tell us your nickname? Tell us more about your nickname, Chief Firefly. <laughs> yes. That comes from Homegrown National Park, and I'll actually talk about it. About that okay, about. very nice, very nice. Okay, uh, we remind everybody to to mute. Um, mute, yes, please everyone mute. We'll do questions at the end. I want to talk about uh, what my idea of nature's best hope is today, and I'll give you a spoiler. You are nature's best hope, and it's <laughs> an awesome responsibility. But let's talk about what uh, E.O. Wilson said about uh, the future of, of nature. He, of course, was a professor at, at uh, Harvard, extremely long, extremely productive career. Uh, he died the day after Christmas this year, so it was a big loss to the world of conservation. But in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. It was the culmination of his career-long uh, effort to save life on planet Earth, not just because he loved biodiversity, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So Half Earth, uh, he had one simple message, and that was, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, anywhere on planet Earth, we have to have functioning ecosystems. We have to have nature on at least half of planet Earth. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save uh, life on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that sounds like a, a great idea. We'll just put half the Earth aside. Problem is, half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got just about 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our uh, infrastructure and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So a lot of people are scratching their heads. How can we actually do this? And that's pretty much what I want to talk about today. I do think we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened uh, in the East Coast of the U.S. in 2019. We have what we call an oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. Uh, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little hole for its head, and it forced its head through that hole. Then it forced its entire body through the hole. It was a tight squeeze. Finally got, got out, um, but that's a dangerous time for this insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, it stays as a pupa in that underground chamber for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses. Uh, that's actually an extension of the head capsule, and the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. After they leave the acorn, though, that, of course, leaves a hole in the acorn, something like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole, they get all excited because their old hole, their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs. The entire colony moves into the new acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard, make sure nobody else comes in. And this is where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point with this little story? Well, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn fly up to a mile from the parent tree. Then they tap it below the surface of the soil and the plan is they're going to go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. You won't have the, the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all week, all year about nature specialized relationships. But the point I want to make this morning is that these relationships, nature itself is now on the ropes. 
And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need them to sustain because it is nature that keeps us alive on this planet. So why have we done this? I don't know, but I suspect we thought that the, the earth, our nest was so large, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's just about a third of our North American bird population already gone. Uh, and then the UN says, well, gee, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction probably in the next 20 years. Uh, and they said that two years ago. So now it's the next 18 years, I guess. Makes a nice headline, but it is not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive in this planet. We have to make sure this does not happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was, was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappear, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our, our animals, the amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here and that is that uh, that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself. But we're gonna have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are, are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that healthy ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day, like oxygen, pretty important, clean water. Plants are slowing and cleaning the water and then slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, building their tissues out of that carving, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. Plants build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they convert sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight and that will be difficult. What do animals do for plants? Lots of things, but importantly, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but uh, today it's a terrible idea because of all of those people that demand it, that 8 billion people who want more and more ecosystem services every single day. Now we do have parks and we do have preserves and they're doing the best they can, but we are in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced. 
Um, so obviously they're not they're not doing enough. It's not good enough. So now we need to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. Now there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that that uh, we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups who've been good at doing that for long periods, uh, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has, has to, than it can, more than it, more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, um, then going to another area doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew that we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he really believed that we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans in nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the, the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. Well, what I want to argue this morning is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. We can't ignore private property because most of the, the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the, of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And of course, we can't afford to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there, absolutely. Uh, but we need to go beyond that now. We need to put nature back together again. We need to restore it. Restoration biology, restoration ecology. And before you tell me that there's no way you can put it back exactly the way it was, I understand that. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions uh, that are nature to create functioning ecosystems once again, even if it's not exactly what was in a particular place at some point in the past. But in order to do that, you have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. Uh, so we have to start with those that do. And there's two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants. And of course, the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. Um, they're capturing energy from the sun and, and through photosynthesis, turning it into food and then storing it in their plant parts. So now we have all the food that supports animals on the planet in plants. But if we don't get that food to the animals, you don't have the animals. And most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate plants, typically insects, and not just any insect. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them, we have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Why caterpillars? What's special about caterpillars? It's actually several things special about caterpillars. One of them is that they are soft. So think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of, of injuring them. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our, our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of, of chitin, of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too. Uh, and it, finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. 
Now I mentioned carotenoids not because I, I love organic chemistry, but uh, it's because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot <clears throat> make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From what they eat, of course. But look, carotenoid content in bird prey atoms is not equally distributed. Caterpillars have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of, of most bird diets. They're essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Let's go uh, to Carolina chickadees. A lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? Well, one or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. Mm -hmm. So you're really talking about tens of thousands Tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. Mm -hmm. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, uh, and I would think you, you do because in so many places, that's all we have. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not create all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that we're measuring these days. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al., the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the bird species, terrestrial bird species, into two groups. The, the groups that, the birds that require insects at some point of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the birds that do not require insects. So things like doves and finches and crossbills can actually make a milk out of the seeds that they eat and feed that to their young. And look, those birds did not decline at all in the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we ask our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, and that's be pretty. Now we have to ask them to do two things, be pretty and be ecologically functional at the same time. And you're not gonna do that unless you have landscapes that include caterpillars. So how do we add caterpillars to landscapes? You do that by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. Seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch. And that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to add the plants that do support a lot of caterpillars. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. That is what a monarch looks like. And you can have all of the, the uh, non-native ornamentals that we typically landscape with. Um, so they could be from South America, they could be from Asia, but rarely are they from uh, wherever you live. You can have all those plants in your yard and you won't support a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to support our monarch is one of the milkweed species. That's called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plants with which they have co-evolved. Why is that? Well, uh, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those tissues either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the, the uh, um, insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there during the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat particular plants. The ones 
for which they have evolved adaptations to get around those, those chemical defenses. Specialized uh, enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked in to eating that particular plant. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you, if you um, take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, monarchs are not gonna start to develop on hostas. They have two choices at that point, fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. So it turns out that there are three types of plants, plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. Good example of a contributor would be one of the oaks. Uh, the genus Quercus is contributing more energy to local food webs than any other plant in, in the entire country. Good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Uh, beautiful tree, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to our local food web. And a good example of a, a detractor would be any one of our invasive ornamentals like a calorie pear or Bradford pear that uh, not only don't produce uh, food themselves, but they escape and push out the native plants that do produce the food that supports those food webs. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. Uh, if we're going to restore the food webs that, that um, allow us to rebuild ecosystems and ecosystem services, in all those places where we've destroyed them, we've got to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when you do choose the right plants, starting with, with uh, what's happened at uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We've got a piece of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. Um, we moved in, in the year 2000 and uh, it had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So there were very few plants there and our goal was to restore uh, ecosystem function on this property. Well, you're not going to do that without adding caterpillars, uh, but I had never done this before. And this was this was early on. I was just just um, fooling around, seeing how, how it might work. I wanted to see if I could get the Canadian outlet to make a living at our house. That's what a Canadian outlet looks like. It's a pretty little thing. I'd never seen a Canadian outlet before. That's what its adult looks like, just like a leaf. We well, don't add Canadian outlets to your property unless you have meadow row. That is the only plant they can eat, and we didn't have any meadow row. So I got some meadow row seeds from someplace and planted them, and they grew very nicely. Uh, but this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian outlets would be able to find my my meadow row. There's no meadow row anywhere around us. So where would the where would the Canadian outlets come from? So I didn't even go out and check the the planting for at least two months after I. Uh, planted them. But then I was walking by for another reason. And I looked over and it was covered with uh, with Canadian Alice. They had found it right away. I'm still surprised about that. Um, so now we have a good population of Canadian Alice and Metaroo. We've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's actually a misnomer. Um, this, this beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. We didn't have any Bidens Aristosa, but I did know where there was some Bidens in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. They actually took over my front yard this, this year. Um, well, I had to wait a whole year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens, but it finally did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. We've added four species to the property. Mm. One the Hackberry Emperor, uh, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. But as its name suggests, uh, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus. And we didn't have any hackberry. So I got a few hackberry trees, planted them. Had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry, but they did. And now we've got uh, a good population of both of those. So we've added six species. And that's how the restoration mm -hmm. went. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Goldenrod, in fact, supports 110 species of caterpillars. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I know people don't like it, but I don't know why they don't like it. It's a great native plant. You can climb our trees without girdling them. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. It makes nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. It's a great pollinator plant, even though the flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. 
You know, it's in bloom when it has this big cloud of native bees around it. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Why don't you see if I get the evening primrose moth in our house? Because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted that. Uh, the moth came, spends a day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it is very cute. Uh, and I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the plants we put back in our yard, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Um, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right, you won't. But if you can enjoy your oak, um, if you can enjoy what your oak contributes to your local food web, and remember that's the goal to restore that ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. Uh, because, and I can say that with with the confidence, because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost a dollar fifty each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that that uh, produce the caterpillars that run the food web at my house. Moths like the uh, solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks in our property and they come right away. This wow. is a pin oak that just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to your local ecosystem. They will do it right away. Hmm. What our property looks like uh, more or less today, that's where the Bidens uh, took over this summer. But we put a lot of plants back. And I learned uh, through our research that if you count the number of moss species, that are in your local food web. It's a good index of uh, how productive and how stable that food web is. So that's what I've been doing over the last five years, taking a picture of every species of moth I could find on our property. And I am up to 1,198 species. So far, I added, added two species this, this uh, week. Um, now, we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania's 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandth of the land mass, we've got 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these moths are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. <laughs> I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. All we did was put the plants back. Well, what would happen if everybody put the plants back? We could turn statistics like this around. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. A lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties in suburbia? Let's go to Mar Margie and Dan Terpstra's house to answer that good question. They've got 0.6 acres. 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They're in the middle of a development. When they moved in, their yard was, was uh, choked with bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle from Asia. So they got rid of that. Then they planted 70 species of native plants, uh, put in a little water feature for the birds. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. That's a lot of warbler species. Just to put that in, into uh, perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. How about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean, in Chicago, that's O'Hare Airport right over there. <laughs> it's one tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. So she, it's a tiny little island. It's a pretty island because Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows how to do it. But she did the same thing. 
she uh, got rid of her non-native plants, planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature uh, for, for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count the birds that are using her yard. And she's up to 124 bird species, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in mm -hmm. Chicago. Okay, there's four things we need to do if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we want to succeed in a big way. One of them is we've got to reduce the area that's in lawn. Uh, we've got about 44 million acres of lawn in this country, which is an area the size of New England, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Hmm. And we know why we do this. This is It's a status symbol. And we also need space to display our Halloween decorations. But what <laughs> if we cut the area in half? What if we took that 40 million acres and, and uh, replanted it? That would give us 20 million acres that we could... Um, we could create a new national park. We're going to restore 20 million acres right where we live. So we'll call it homegrown national park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park would be the biggest park in the country. Hmm. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that we take out of lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are going to hold up that house. They're essential. They're the support system. We cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last hundred years. Mm. You know, through building your house, once you put in your, your uh, keystone plants, but they're an essential first step. So the question is, is no longer simply, are natives ecologically better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. But there are a number of natives that don't contribute all that much either. So the question really is, do we want to put in the most powerful plants, the biggest contributors to help the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? What plants do support the most caterpillars? Well, it's it's the oaks. 557 species of caterpillars supported in the mid-Atlantic states alone, over 950 species nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. So if you want to know um, what the best plants in your where you live are, go to Native Plant Finder, the National Federation website, uh, put in your zip code and the ranked list of both the woody and herbaceous plants that are best in your county will pop up. Uh, so this is what a typical list will look like for much of the country. Uh, I'm sorry, this is only for the, the mainland. We don't have this information for islands yet. It'd be great if we could get it, but that will take a lot more research. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite uh, a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. <laughs> um, light pollution is turning out to be one of the major causes of insect decline. Uh, we have these are all the ways that lights kill insects. Somebody's got a mute out there. Yeah, I got it. I got it muted. Okay, um, so this is actually good news to me because we've got to stop insect decline, not just stop it, we've got to turn it around. And if we can do that by just uh, flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. Um, but I know what you're gonna say. Well, I can't turn the light out over my, my uh, barn or over my garage or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so that uh, it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you realize is the bad man doesn't come very often. <laughs> you don't wanna do that, Take the white bulb out of your, your uh, security light and put in a yellow bulb. Both uh, incandescent or LEDs are available. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white or blue wavelengths. So if we switched out our lights, um, our, our white lights for yellow lights overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to uh, use keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to invite mosquito foggers to come kill all the insects in our yard. And, and they really do. And these fogging companies say it's okay because uh, 
this is a natural product. And it is a natural product. That's pyrethroids. It's a compound that evolved in chrysanthemums to kill insects in chrysanthemums. Mm. Uh, it's industrial strength, uh, uh, pyrethroids. But cyanide is a natural product too. So arguing that it's natural does not mean that it's, it's not going to kill all the insects. But they say it doesn't. They say it only kills mosquitoes. And, you know, I wish that was true, but it's not. It's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact, all, all the pollinators, monarchs too. There was a big monarch killed two years ago when they flew through Mosquito Joe. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. The interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of the adults to, to uh, get effective control. A mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%. If you really want to kill mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage with uh, mosquito dunks. This is a Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. So what you do is you attract mosquitoes to a bucket. You fill it full of, of water and put in a handful of, of straw or hay or maybe dead leaves and let diatoms and algae build up in that bucket. And that becomes an irresistible brew to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They'll lay their eggs in your bucket. You put in a mosquito dunk that you've gotten at the hardware store, cost $9 or $12, something like that. The larvae hatch, they eat the mosquito dunk and they die. It's extremely targeted. Uh, if you get a dragonfly in here, it won't hurt it at all. If your dog drinks it, it won't hurt it. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so that a chipmunk doesn't commit suicide, but... It's targeted, it's cheap, and very effective, particularly if everybody does it. But you know, this works as well. Just get a fan, plug it in, and, and it creates enough breeze that the mosquitoes can't fly into it. And then you don't have to kill anything. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical landscape like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. Uh, it tells people that that uh, it tells your neighbors that this is just not a bunch of weeds that you forgot to mow, um, that it's intentional. Uh, it's beautiful when it's in bloom. It, it meets the needs of several species of bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, it would help a lot. And remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time that we need them because they pollinate a third of our crops, but I don't like that argument. First of all, it's not accurate. They only pollinate about a twelfth of our crops. Uh, and I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Everybody needs pollinators. We need pollinators every place we need plants because it is pollinators that pollinates 80% of the plants that are out there and 90% of the flowering plants. Mm -hmm. If we lost our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, and that is not an option. How about this? A Drew Latham design. It's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life that is supported here versus the amount of life that's supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one's uh, important. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it, we like to visit it, like to go hiking, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when, when push comes to shove, when, when resources are in short supply, nature takes a back seat. And of course, resources are always in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. And there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, save nature, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so that future generations can enjoy it. And I understand that nature is enormously entertaining, but it's much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. Mm -hmm. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We talked about that, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to the places where there's not a lot of humans, uh, we're going to fail because th those places are too small and too isolated. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our, our uh, ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I don't like that language because it suggests they're places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. <laughs> Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. 
So we need to put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, not just to make uh, biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats where we've destroyed them. This is starting to happen. Uh, and when it does happen, when we're finished, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans actually have coexisted with nature. Hmm. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I'm not sure why, because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't we all share the, the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? All right, we got it. <laughs> okay. uh, Stan Reshworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. Hmm. You're not born with those mindsets. You're taught those mindsets. We're very good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That does not mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, right now, a lot of people are recognizing that the planet is in trouble, uh, but people feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the land. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can use keystone plants. One person can get rid of the invasive plants on their property. We didn't even talk about that. One person can fire Mosquito Joe. One person can totally revitalize the ecosystem uh, on their property and then enhance their local ecosystem rather than degrading it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, you have convinced us. <laughs> and I I do I, I did get your jokes too. Sometimes they sometimes they were understated, but I get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow, where do we begin? First of all, thank you. This should be in every school, every church, every civic organization. It should be all over. I'm trying. <laughs> we will try to help you as well. This is going to go on um, our websites, uh, our YouTube channels, and I'll encourage other people um, here and, and everywhere else to, to do this as well. We have a teacher here, Pat Manny. What what? What question? I'm pretty sure you have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just really wanted to say this was such an excellent presentation. You really captured our attention. You presented and everything was flowing so well. Excellent job, um, Professor Talami. Um, So I had a lot of questions. I'm actually um, arguing right now with my fiance on what kind of plants we should be putting outside and one of the arguments that he brought up was fruit trees so he wants fruit trees but I want things to look pretty <laughs> so are there any fruit trees that can probably act as um, food sources for pollinators that we can use yeah you know, it depends on where you live uh, and it depends on what what fruits are naturally you know, are native to where you live. But remember, we need food too. So growing food for agriculture and, and growing it locally on your own property, that's great. That saves transportation costs. Uh, it's, it's difficult to use your agriculture as a conservation mechanism at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're really two different things. So I would say grow your fruit trees uh, and whatever fruit you want. And then the other parts of your your property, that's where you put in uh, the most powerful native plants you can you can get. But it's going to be hard to do both with the same plants. 
Okay. okay. Thank you. I saw that you um you also mentioned the use of the mosquito dunks. I will be looking for that in our <laughs> in our garden shops because mosquitoes is such a big problem for us here in Trinidad. But I was wondering, um, do you think that has any environmental effects in case of dunking um of the wastewater after? No, because it's this is a specific bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And it's not active forever. So you can just dump it on the ground. It's totally harmless to everything okay. else. Okay. All right. Great. Thank so much you. better than mosquito fogging. It kills everything. Yes. That's such a great option. It really opened my eyes. I'm going to look for it. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of eye openers here. A lot. <laughs> it was coming at rates of seconds. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. I'm writing. I'm writing. Anyway, um, Pat, see your hand. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that I was wondering whether to come on today because the talk was on invasive species, which I am interested in. But this was definitely a wow um, experience. And thank you so much indeed. But I would recommend too to Miss Ramutar that if she wants to see what works for attracting butterflies in Trinidad, go visit the butterfly garden in the Royal Botanic Gardens. The, if you look at the plants that we have there, we did precisely what Professor Tallamy has done. We targeted host plants, and he is absolutely correct. Target the host plants and the butterflies and moths come. It works, and it's a fantastic experience. Wonderful. But thank you so much indeed. You're welcome. But following up on... And what Pat said, one of the things that we need, so this is something I've always been thinking about what, since I started getting into the these topics, is, is there a place we can go to find what plants attracts what insects in pollinators? And you gave that to us, Nature Plant Finder. Native Plant right? Finder. Native yes. Plant. Right. But it is, from what you said, it's limited to North America. Is that correct? So far, but um, okay. Black Rock Bank is actually funding us to make lists for every country in the world. And we're working on okay. that. Okay. So, not done yet, but it All will right. be. Expanded. Yeah. So, that, so we could maybe contribute I mean, to that in Trinidad. Correct. Once it's, once that um, database really is completed, Everyone around the world would have access to it. Right. That's the idea. <laughs> it's okay. a big job. <laughs> please, please, please keep us up to date. Um, would you be putting that information on your homegrown? Where yeah, would that, you... that is going to be an enormous database. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to okay. disappear. We do want it to be available to everybody. But, you know, I, I want to be able to walk into Germany and say, here's here's a list for your plants. Right. Uh, Walk into Trinidad. That's great. Venezuela. They're yeah. probably going to be very similar. Right. Um, it's going to be by eco region. Uh, you know, country boundaries mean nothing to plants or, or animals. So mm -hmm. it'll be the eco regions. So someplace like like Venezuela or Germany or or North America, they have a lot of different eco regions. So you you see where you are, which eco region you belong to, and you do that by a map, and then the best plants for that eco region will pop up. That's the plan. Okay. Pat Manny or Pat, is the, do you know of any efforts, say, at the university or the herbarium to do something like that locally? Um, uh, the university tends to have a lot of those oak trees, those really large trees. So they do tend to have them. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like a continuous effort at the moment. So we don't have, like, at this point, a local database mm -hmm. connecting plants to pollinate, mm -hmm. as far as you know. Not to my knowing. Okay. The big, the big challenge is you have to go back in the literature for the last hundred years and write down host records, which plants are supporting which insects. That's mm -hmm. what takes the time. It's out there. The information's out there. But um, so, for example, a lot of the South American records, they're in Great Britain because th those were the explorers that came over to, to do that work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it takes a while to track it all down. And that's what we're working on. OK, very good. Dr. Murray. 
Yes. Yeah. When, <laughs> may I just may I just say when it comes to <clears throat> plant species, etc., in Trinidad, in the National Herbarium, and the National Herbarium will be giving a talk on in December. Right. Uh, so I would, and they have the checklist of the plants, a serious collection, a very mm. large collection of plants, but they don't tie them into butterflies or or oh, any yes. other pollinators. They do not connect the dots, in other words. Okay. They just work in almost like in a silo, right. which is right. not what Professor Ptolemy has done. He kind of opened up the silo. <laughs> Thank right. you. But, but knowing what plants are there is, is uh, that's half the battle right there, because in a lot of places, we don't even know that much. <laughs> right. No, well, they have they have a tremendous um, collection now, a very modern, updated collection in the National Herbarium at the University of the West Indies in the right. Sir Frank Stockdale building. Yeah. So we have them coming on in December. Yeah. Or something. And I could connect you, Professor Talamy, Tal with them. Um, so you guys could maybe do some collaboration there. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe through email. Uh, and yes. I can mm -hmm. it's my my research associate who's who's doing most of this work. I can give get her email to them and see if she already she may already have the database. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, okay. That sounds good. Um other people, other persons have questions. I know Princella said she had to take off. Zach. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, just one thing. Um, I actually have a, a bit of a, a dream, hopefully it's not a pipe dream, <laughs> to uh, achieve, uh, take farmland and convert it back to a natural state, kind of like you mentioned, your 10 acres. Um, what were the biggest challenges you saw in the early years? And were you concerned of anything such as like lingering pesticides, fungicides, et cetera, from, from the farm uh, that used to be there? No, the, the biggest challenge, there's two big challenges. One, of, of course, is the invasive, all of the non-natives that, that come in immediately. They love disturbance and farms are, you know, nothing but disturbance. So they colonize right away and you've got to remove them. And of course, my neighbors have not removed there. So there's this constant seed rain. We always have to be vigilant to keep them out. Um, that's problem number one. Problem number two is where we are is the overabundance of deer. Mm. Uh, and that that makes the invasive species problem worse because the deer eat the native plants, but not the non-natives. So uh, it tips the competitive balance ag against our natives. If we didn't have too many deer, our natives are quite competitive. They could they could fight the autumn olive and the multiflora rose and the bush honeysuckle. But you know the baby oak comes up, the first thing that happens, it gets eaten by deer. So there's no way it can outcompete those other things. Those are the two challenges that we're we're facing all the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was also fascinated with the section dealing with caterpillars and the carotenoids. And I'm going to be looking for someone to give us a chemistry. That's my area. A chemistry talk, talk about the chemistry of caterpillars because you, you fascinated me with them being as nutritious and so there is a lot of chemistry and biochemistry I know underlying that. So thanks That's for that. For sure. Biology is just chemistry in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. I think you might find that some of these caterpillars may be nutritious, but they may have things that wouldn't necessarily agree with you. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that oh, yes. is also true. <laughs> Caterpillars don't want to be eaten either. So they have a lot of defense mechanisms. Yeah. That's and one right. of them is they they sequester the nasties from the plant that they're eating so that they don't taste good. Mm -hmm. and in which case, they're not an important part of the food web. So, yeah, yeah it's not all caterpillars. It's some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your presentation was not just, you know, well organized, had a, low, a flow, a nice flow, but it was pretty. <laughs> I've never seen so many different caterpillars in my life. Yeah, nature is beautiful. <laughs> wow. Where do you go to find them? I guess now you have a 
a lot of them in your own place. Yeah, all those pictures are from my yard. Oh, wow. I, I go outside. Okay. <laughs> but, but I do a lot of it at night. Caterpillars come out at night. They're hiding during the day because they don't want the birds to eat them. Right. So there's another whole world out there when you take a flashlight out at night. You see things you never see during the day. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Wow, this has been one of the best. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, we could take a couple more questions at least before we take off here. So if nobody else, what one of the terms that I got from you that I really, really love is restoration biology or restoration ecology. That should actually be a course. Do you teach oh, it's, it a, it's a whole discipline. Yeah, there's a journal and everything else. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Restoration. I'm going to look that up. Restoration biology. Restoration ecology. Okay. Hi, I'm. I'm. Katrina? I would like to just yes, Katrina here from Trinidad and Tobago on behalf of the Council of Presidents of the Environment. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. So I am actually doing a course in restoration biology right now. Oh. So it's really good online. Um, but to say that it's so great to see what you've done in your in your space. You know, it's like people, especially in my country, they don't recognize that their land area, though it's quite small, that it has the potential to be um you know a uh, 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 resource for the environment to, to continue its, its services and products and stuff like that so i think that it's great and i hope that you know within our education system here i'm hoping to encourage people to, in, to increase their knowledge on what they can do in their small spaces um mm -hmm. so like for myself i would love to do a rooftop garden on my home although in the caribbean it's not done usually like we just have you know the corrugated iron roof which is such a waste of, of space in my opinion so I actually do want to do wildflowers on my roof when I do get a roof <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you so much for the encouragement on that part because it was great thank you thank you you know that's that's an important point I didn't mention is that 82 percent of us live in cities so um, they can participate through container gardening Picture an apartment complex with, you know, seven, eight stories. If everybody had containers with with important native plants on their balcony, rather than being like a, a, a cliff to a, a pollinator, it could be a, a an important foraging resource. Mm -hmm. And of course, we did that all over the place in cities. Cities wouldn't be dead zones the way they are in so many places. That's so we a, can put the, the native plants back into cities, but it'd probably be mostly in containers. Yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, I did see of one city where they had transferred their bees to the rooftops. Yeah, and their which it was it was um was in, in Indonesia or well, you know, the uh, that it was. City. It's happening in New York in Manhattan. Yeah, okay. no, it's absolutely. I thought that was great. And then we get honey as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you're right. Singapore is is leads the world in urban urban restoration it's a oh. very very green city okay okay singapore maybe it was singapore that i saw it but okay. um but coming to think of it i think you're correct so right katrina yeah that, that yeah. Re restoration uh course is that at ue no no it's not it's uh i can't remember the organization that's doing it right now but i can send you that information later i okay. think it was uh, hang on, let me see if I can find it in my email. But I was going to mention that I visited Singapore in 2006. Um, and I can tell you that from then, they had started planning. So this is how many years later, and this is where they're at now. Um, mm -hmm. Back then, it was just Sentosa Island. That was like the designated nature reserve. Mm -hmm. And now the city itself, um, because remember, uh, Singapore is about the same size as Trinidad, and the entire thing is almost concrete. Um, so they have solutions that need to, uh, you know, to, to battle that, <laughs> that, that kind of setting. So it's interesting to see where it's gone in that space of time, you know? Yes, yes. 
All right. All right. Well, we could go on and on and on, <laughs> but we have to come to the end. And we want to thank everyone for coming on here, uh, taking time out of out of your busy day. Uh, especially want to thank uh, Professor Douglas, Chief Firefly. Yeah, I don't want to get close on your own lights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, also want to thank my co-host today, Padmani Ramatar. I could see her brain working. How do I get my students involved with this? <laughs> yes, <that>. very much <laughs> so. <laughs> Indeed, wondering where can I put these in the school? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Professor, you you it seemed like you have a something that you wanted to say. Oh, I just can say if you do that with your students, they will love it. They really do love this stuff. Yes, yes, they do. They would. All right. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Professor Talamy. Thank you, Padmani. And we hope thank you very much. Have a very, great very weekend. interesting. All right. informative. Everybody, take care. Take care. Bye bye. For more information about our sponsors and partners, please visit the Environmental Friday's Partners and Sponsors page. Be sure to visit our website at www.theenvironmentalfridays.com.